uh, but it's not the, the subject that we uh, study along the thesis. However, I think it's important to talk about it. So, how do we deal with the self-interference? Why do we have first self-interference? So, full duplex is actually like talking and listening at the same time. At least me, I cannot do it. Probably someone in the audience can, but I can. So, I'm going to listen what I what I talk. And in secret, what we're going to do is we're going to have most of the time three stages. We're going to have digital cancellation, analog cancellation. In this part, we are going to have circuits that are going to treat the signals, and then we have another domain which we can say it's the propagate the propagation domain in which we can put barriers between the transmitter, we can separate the antennas, or we can put filters. However, in real life, we can never achieve perfect self-interference, even if we have super complex system. And if we want to have um, good results, we have to cancel, for instance, around 110 dB. And this is for small cells. So this is quite challenging. Uh, but there are some works, for instance, here works by colleagues from Kumu Networks. It's a company in the United States that are pushing towards uh, the implementation of real-life uh, transceiver uh, that can achieve around these values of uh, cancellation. However, there are more challenges. We have that the costs are going to increase since we're going to have a additional uh, equipment in the transceiver. Energy consumptions are going to rise at the same time, and they're going to be a constraint in terms of space. So this is why, along our work, we focus in one model, which is the three-node full duplex model. What, what is the three-node? We're going to assume that only base stations, given the, the previous constraints, are going to be in full duplex, and users are going to stay in the half duplex uh, scenario. So, I just told you that I'm not going to focus in the self-interference. I'm going to focus in the higher interference that is present in the in full duplex network. So, why do we have higher interference? If we see the figures in a half duplex scenario, we're going to have the downlinks in the left hand side are only going to be interfered by, by other downlinks. For uplinks, it's the same thing. Uplinks are going to be interfered only by uplinks, even the orthogonality or the synchronization. However, in full duplex, since we're going to be using the research block for uplink and downlink at the same time, downlinks are going to suffer also from, for, from uplinks here. And in the figure, we're going to see that in the uplink, we're going to have the self-interference for our model, but at the same time, interference coming from other base stations. It can be quite uh, dramatic in terms of interference since the, propagation, the power of the base station is super high. So, uh, in fact, we see that given all these constraints of, of uh, interference, we're going to see that most of the time we're going to have full duplex prototypes in small cells, since the small cells have lower transmission power. Even though we see these drawbacks, we models or current results already show us that we can profit for full, from full duplex, and in the downlinks we can gain or we can gain around 50 percent in terms of rate or in terms of uh, average spectral efficiency. But uplinks are going to be strongly uh, degraded, so uh, values can go around 90 percent. We can have uh, Sometimes uh, around full degradation in terms of downlink, uplink. If we sorry, if we compare it to half duplex. So the main objective of our work um, was to manage this additional interference in the network, uh, to reduce the uplink degradation, which is critical, but at the same time to try to maintain the gains that we are we were observing in the downlink. So let us go briefly uh, into the mathematical framework, framework that we use. We based in stochastic geometry uh, to model our models. In the middle we have a typical hexagonal uh, deployment model. This is the model that was uh, used before, or it's still used, in order to model cellular um, networks. From here comes the name cell, a cell. But in real life, deployments are quite different from what we have in the two models. So stochastic geometry, uh, what it proposes is to have random deployment uh, according to a given distribution. Uh, for instance, in the left hand side we have a random deployment and we see that the network resembles much more what is happening in real life. And at the same time, another huge gain is that we will be able to have tractable expressions, uh, which is extremely beneficial for operators and for people that are modeling the, the cellular networks. 
the one, the point process that is mostly used, and this is only a main example, is the Poisson point process. So why is it is Poisson? So we have, if we have a random deployment, and if we take a snapshot, where, and if, if we calculate the probability of having a certain amount of numbers in this, in this uh, uh, frame, we're going to see that the mean is going to distribute according to, to Poisson. And this mean, we call it the intensity measure, which is, of course, a function of its density, which we call the intensity function. We use three main pro uh, properties in our work. First, we have the thinning of a point process. What, what is the thinning? Is that we're going to retain points according to a given probability. And this is quite handy for Poisson point processes because we know if we apply a uh, a uh, thinning process to it, we're going to create another point process. Second, secondly, we use the Campbell theorem. What does Campbell theorem allow us to do is to uh, compute sums over point processes. In this case, we take the expected value of the sum over a point process, we can write it in an integral way that only depends on, on the main parameter of, our, of the point process, which is the intensity measure. Extremely useful. And last but not least, we have the probability generation functional, which allow us, differently to the Campbell theorem, to uh, compute products over point processes. And in this case, for instance, we can write it as an exponential. So this is our tractable and closed form expression that will help us uh, find key, uh, key values for the network. So what can we do with all this? For us, it all starts with the SINR. So the SINR, the signal, uh, to interference plus noise ratio is given by the ratio between the power received from a given source divided by the interference. Look that the interference is the sum over a point process plus the noise. This is a random variable. So when we want to calculate the coverage probability, which is the probability that our SINR is superior to a given threshold gamma, we're going to be able to treat it by using the, the properties that I already gave. So, for instance, if we consider a Rayleigh fading channel, we're going to derive that the, pro the coverage probability will be of this form. So we will have an integral that depends on the PDF, or the probability density function, of the distance between user and scheduled base station, times the Laplace transfer of the interference and the noise. The, this Laplace transfer we can easily compute it by using the previously mentioned theorems. Uh, and we can go further. <coughs> Uh, we can derive from this expression the ergodic capacity by this uh, closed form equation that you see in the right bottom side of the slide. In fact, if we divide this expression by the bandwidth, we will have the average spectral efficiency. So, let us go into our solutions, that we, the, the solution that we propose. But before doing this, let us remember what is our goal reduce the upping degradation and maintain the, prof the good performance of the downing. So. Uh, what we thought is, why don't uh, we adopt full duplex only when the, when the conditions are favorable for us? So that's what we did. We proposed a duplex switching policy, which means base stations can switch to half duplex or full duplex, depending on the conditions. So let us focus in the right bottom side of the slide. We have a base station, and what we want is we want the upping user to be close the base station in order to increase the SINR. So we introduce a ter first parameter, which is the parameter RF. Secondly, since we want to maintain the, the good performance of, of the downing, or even try to increase it, we introduce another distance between the uplink user and the downing user in the same cell. cell. That's what we call delta. If some of these conditions is not met, we're going to adopt half duplex. So for the system model, we have, we're going to have a hybrid network in which we will have base stations operating in full duplex and some others in, in half duplex. This is the probability P. There are other works that have this kind of hybrid networks. For instance, I'm just going to mention two. We have works by Alamuri. In this work, we have uh, not the same uh, procedure. However, what authors do is that they have uh, overlap of the bandwidth between Downing, uh, sorry, of the downing and uplink, yes, bandwidth with the overlap. And in this case, even though 
Thus, the procedure is different. The results are quite similar, since we're going to have still a hybrid network. And the second one is the work by Tang, in which they also have a duplex chain policy. However, here in this work, it's the user that decides what to do, not the base station. In our model, users and, and base stations transmit at their maximum power, and we have omnidirectional antennas. For the self-interference, we uh, characterize the residual self-interference, which is what is left after the cancellation, and we model it as follows. We multiply the transmitted power by a, a, constant, a constant beta. Beta goes from 0 to 1, which means if beta equals to 0, we're not going to have any self-interference remaining. If it's equal to 1, we're not going to be able to cancel anything, which is the worst case. And finally, we have that cell users are associated to the closest base station. What we were able to do mathematically is to find a way to easily characterize the probability of being in full duplex or not. We achieved this expression by taking some assumptions and simplification assumptions. So we assume that processes of users are independent and the, the position of a user to its scheduled base station is independent at the same time, which is not true, but it works. Uh, so we see that it depends the probability of being in full duplex. Only of our two parameters, RF, which is how close is the uplink user to the base station, and delta, the separation between scheduled uplink and downlink user. If RF, RF increases, we're going to increase the probability of being in full duplex. If delta decreases, we're going to be uh, with high probability in a half duplex scenario. And by using similar tools as before, we can calculate the average spectral efficiency this expression are, are not new, we already talked about that, but since we have a hybrid network, we're going to be able to use our P, so the probability of going in full duplex, in order to characterize the average spectral efficiency of uplinks or downlinks in our network. Results are the following. So, on the top, we have the downlink average spectral efficiency, bottom, we have the uplink average spectral efficiency as a function of RF. What is RF? Remember, the distance between the user, the uplink user, and the base station. Different cores are for different values of delta. So let us focus in the downlink. In the black dashed lines, we have the performance of full duplex, where all base stations are in full duplex. In the red dotted line, we have the performance of a half duplex system in downlink. We firstly see full duplex is superior. However, with our model, we can go above it. How do we achieve it? By finding an optimal, para, an optimal value for delta. So in this case, we see that delta is equal to 100 meters. We want a user in the uplink to be uh, slightly apart from the one in the downlink. That way we can go above it. If not, we're going to achieve the same performance of full duplex. We see, in contrast, a different uh, behavior for the uplink. So we have a trade-off. We will not be able to gain in both sides at the same time. For the uplink, the better performance, or in which we can achieve better performance than half duplex, which is better than full duplex in the uplink, it's going to be when the values of RF are closed. Why? Because we are forcing users in uplink to be close to the base station. So by doing this, we are increment, we are enhancing the SINR. Uh, and so we can optimize this function. And what the operator can do is to uh, choose different configurations in order to satisfy their, their demands or, the, or what they want to achieve. So, in a first configuration, maybe the operator wants to have a maximization of the downlink capacity and the downlink performance, so we can achieve even 10% uh, higher performance than the full duplex case. In a second configuration, which is not the same as before, we're going to be able, to be in this regime, we're going to be able to surpass the performance of half duplex. And in a third one, we can be more conservative and we say, let us just simply uh, completely uh, have zero degradation in the uplink, but we will have a slightly lower performance in the downlink. What is the takeaway of this work? So this is a flexible tool for operators to favor one, one link uh, against the other, but in order to gain, we will have to shut down uh, some of the full duplex uh, base stations in the network and there are some implementation challenges since it's not easy to measure distances uh, by base stations. So this is not easy to implement. Second solution, second work, 
still to let us remember what is our goal, we want to reduce the upping degradation while maintaining the down performance. So, we went into studying how full duplex works in the millimeter wave spectrum. Why millimeter wave? The key reasons is the following. So, in millimeter wave, we can unlock beamforming. And what beamforming is, we saw it at the beginning, we're going to direct our signal towards the intended receiver. By doing so, we can reduce the interference, which is what we want in full duplex. We want to reduce the interference in order to enhance the performance. And actually, what we're going to have is that millimeter, uh, by doing beamforming, we're going to have noise limited. So our, our motivation was firstly to see how full duplex behaves in this scenario. Secondly, is it this hybrid network uh, where we have full duplex and half duplex by base station useful? And third, thirdly, uh, could it be useful to, to implement some power control in the dummy, which is not done. Once again, we have a network with uh, a hybrid network where the probability of being in full duplex is B. Small cells. Users are going to transmit that are, are their maximum power, but base stations, uh, full duplex base stations, are not. They're going to be characterized by a, by a parameter rho. So rho is the power control. If rho is equal to 1, we're not going to degrade at all the downlink power. If it's equal close to 0, we're going to strongly degrade it, which is not actually what we want to do. For the, for the antenna patterns, we just did a simplification and we assume that we have a two-lobe model. So in this model, there's a main lobe that have a maximum gain and there's a side lobe that have a minimum gain. So we can think a little bit further and we see that we have two scenarios. So one scenario that is favorable for full duplex is the one in the left, in which the separation between the transmitted and the receiving beams in a base station are sufficiently big in order to have the minimum gains of the antennas to interfere between each other. But we have another one in which our beams overlap. This is not favorable at all because if we have high gains, uh, we're going to have a huge self-interference, which is something that's going to further degrade the, the uplink uh, up <coughs> performance. To model our system, we inspired in words by Professor Pirenzo, uh, how the work made under the assumption that we have half duplex equipment, but we, we introduced our hybrid model with uh, our novel way of modeling the residual self interference and further the power control in the downing. So the model is the following uh, users now are going to be attached to the base station that provide the minimum path loss. We're going to have links in line of sight, outage, and no line of sight. Why we have this? Because in millimeter wave we have this propagation issue, so it's important to consider these parameters when modeling the network. And thirdly, we're going to have that a user is going to see the base stations that are surrounding itself as base station in one of the different states of uh, channel states. And so in order to bring tractability to the, to the model, what we're going to uh, what the model proposes is to transform this two-dimensional uh, deployment into one, uh, to a process only in one dimension. This is by using the displacement theory. theorem. Sorry. I'm going to summarize the, the mathematical expression only with showing you the uplink power probability. Why? Because the rest are included in, in this. So, for the uplink power probability, what we're going to have is that the performance is going to depend on being in the favorable case that I recently showed or being in the not so favorable case. Uh, so it depends on the geometry of the beams. Uh, and at the same time, it depends on the function. This function, ah, sorry, uh, before I continue, when we consider the other, uh, the other links, so tau link, for instance, or the half duplex cases, we're just going to uh, we're not going to consider the, the geometry, and we're just going to have a noise limited network when we consider only the function f, which is given by the following expression. Uh, the function f is going to depend on the intensity measure of the channels, channel states, and at the same time, 
of a, a Q function. So the Q function is not in, not increasing function. So for instance, if we increase the interference, the coverage probability will decrease. So this is why the not so favorable ca case kills our performance. In the following slide, we see the average spectral efficiency for downlink and uplink. Downlink and uplink as a function of the probability of being in full duplex for different values of our power control probe. The first thing that we can notice is that uh, there is no point in the middle that, that, that maximizes our performance. So, in fact, there is no interest in having a hybrid network. For uplinks, our best choice is going to be always to have a half duplex scenario. For downlinks, we're always going to gain with full duplex, so we're going to prefer the probability one of being in full duplex. But interestingly, we see that for the uplink, if we reduce the downlink power, we can be able to maintain the performance of half duplex, which is what we are trying to achieve. For the downlink, on the other hand, the lower the power of transmission, the lower the performance. So what we want in the, up, the downlink is to have the biggest power as possible. So this table <coughs> summarizes what's going on. For downlink, if we don't do any, any power control, we can be close to doubling the performance of half duplex in terms of average spectral efficiency, which is close to the theoretical bound. It's quite important. But for the uplink, we see that if we consider real values of the self-interference cancellation, we're still going to have huge degradation. If we consider a perfect scenario in which we cancel the whole self-interference, we can be close to the to doubling the, the performance, which is the theoretical bound. So in fact, what we see is that here it's not the, the problem of, of the of the beamforming. The, the problem is of the self-interference cancellation and the beamforming at the same time. So if we reduce the power, hugely reduce it by 85%, we avoid degradation in the uplink and we reduce the, the, the gains in the downlink by still we have good values. So the conclusions or the takeaway of this uh, part of the work is that we see that the gains in millimeter wave are mostly due to the beamforming, not to millimeter wave by itself. Uh, we see that downlinks are close to the theoretical bound without doing anything. And that the power reduction of a downlink helps the uplink, but at the same time we don't want to reduce the power in the downlink since we're going to completely affect the, the coverage probability of downlinks. Uh, and that still there's a huge dependence on the performance due to the, the self-interference cancellation capability. Our third and final uh, system is coordination between base stations. And as you remember, this is the last time I remember it. Our goal is to reduce the uplink degradation, but to maintain the, the profitable downlink performance. So we thought of coordinating base stations in the network. How do we do this? We base ourselves in non-orthogonal multiple access uh, signals and in successive interference cancellation, SIC. So in our model, a base station will adapt, when possible, uh, its transmission scheme in the downlink in order to help another base station in the network. So we can think of two ways of doing this. We can think of a distributed topology or a centralized topology. For a distributed topology, what we're going to have here is X, the base station X, it's going to have a downlink rate here. And if, if this rate here is uh, less or equal to this capacity from this link, base station X prime is going to be able to perform successive interference cancellation since it can decode the message and apply it to its uplink uh, message. That way, he will cancel the interference coming from this uh, uh, base station. Sorry. In a central run, run, sorry, we can think of an ideal case in which we have a central entity that manages all these uh, messages and the rates. So we can avoid considering that we have a certain capacity in an ideal case, a perfect case, and we can consider this is infinite. So let me go deeper into this. The algorithm is the following. So let us now suppose that I'm a base station. I am base station X. And I'm going to build, by listening to my surroundings, I'm going to build a set of interference base stations. I'm going to build this by considering the M strongest interference base station. Why M? Because we will, this is 
the uh, number of base stations that we will eventually uh, be able to cancel, and we will perform SIG to do so. And for SIG, we cannot consider m to infinity, so this is a, a fixed number. Uh, so in the figure, we see that if I'm x, I'm the base station x, these two base stations here, surrounded by the gray area, are the ones belonging to my set I m. Then, me and all my all the rest of the base station communicate their set, sets, and so I can know to whom I am bothering. If I am part of a, a set I am of another base station, my, and then I'm going to create a, a second set G. By, by having all this information, I can I can measure or estimate the capacity between me and the people that I and the base station that I uh, interfere strongly interfere, and I can calculate the minimum capacity between me and uh, the one that is the furthest, for instance, from myself. And I'm going to fix my rate according to this minimum capacity and to an additional parameter that we introduce, which is nu star. I'm going to go more into details into the, the shape of uh, the, the downing rate in the following slide. So don't get anxious. If base stations are able to adapt their rate, then I'm going to have a set of base stations that are going that I am going to be able to decode. This is the set U. And finally, the rate of the uplink is going to be simply the rate of the of the uplink user minus the interference from the interference from the base station that I can decode. I promised you that I was going to talk to you about the downlink rate. So the downlink rate is given by this expression which depends on the capacity of the downing. So for instance, our parameter nu, nu star is just a parameter that tells me how much do I tolerate to degrade my downing. Let us fix nu star to 1. In this case, we're going to have that I don't tolerate at all the degradation of my downing, and so the capacity is going to be equal to the rate. So whenever I have a huge value or a value close to 1 for new star, I'm going to be in a first case in which the rate depends only on the capacity and my parameter new star. There's a second case in which I, as an operator, allow the degradation of my downing, so new star is going to be small. And in this case, see if it's, for instance, 0, I'm just going to have the capacity uh, of the mean we're going to have the capacity between me and the base station that I is defaulted from me. So this is semi. We can in fact have zero here, but our goal is not to degrade to zero. That this is why we have the shape of maximum and minimum depending on semi. And a third case, which is the ideal case, in which semi is bigger than the capacity of the downing. In this case, it just means that even though I'm transmitting as a huge uh, rate, everyone that's interfered by myself is going to be able to decode my message. This is what this constraint is saying. So in this case, I just transmit at the capacity of the time. Okay. Uh, to model this, we go back again to our first model. We have Rayleigh really fading and we have users attached to their closest base station. And interestingly, since there is going to be a coordination between the base stations, we're going to be interested on how the uh, coverage probability between these base, base stations uh, behaves. It looks the, probability, the coverage probability quite similar to the ones we are already seeing. However, we, uh, we propose a novel way of modeling the interference between, uh, so what we are measuring here, sorry, is the coverage probability between myself and my end closest neighbor. So we divided the interference of base station in two sets. A first set of the, of the base stations that are inside, or there are the n minus 1, n minus 2 neighbors. And for this, we just assume that they, they were distributed in a uniform way inside a disk. And then the rest, they, we just perform the, the, the typical, use the typical properties that we used before. For the uplink coverage probability, uh, what we did is what, that we used a thinning of the original process. Uh, so to do that, 
there are going to be some base stations that are going to be able, that I am going to be able to decode, and some others that I'm not going to be able to decode. So the probability of not being decodable is the probability of being outside the set, my set of n strongest interference, or being inside but having a huge rate. So me, base station X, I'm not going to be able to decode. In this slide, we, we see the validation of our model. In the left of the base station to base station coverage probability. We see in dashed lines the, the theoretical values and in bold lines the, the simulator ones. Uh, we see that the result match well for n uh, bigger than 2. For the second case, for the upping coverage probability, uh, the dashed lines here are for theoretical values and simulation are bold ones. In black, we have the full duplex upping coverage probability, which is highly degraded with respect to the one of half duplex, and our solution is in the middle. So just by, by cancelling one interference base station, we're going to be able to increase the, the coverage probability by 3 dB. In terms of mean rate, we have in the top part the downlink mean rate, and in the bottom the uplink mean rate as a function of m, so how big is the amount of, of my set i m, how many base stations can I decode, ideally. And the different curves are for different values of the degradation of the down. Obviously, for downings, we don't want to degrade, so the, be the best performance is achieved when mu star is equal to 1. We don't degrade at all, and in this case, we're just going to be, have the same performance of a full duplex system, where all base stations run full duplex. For the uplink, we have the opposite. We want to degrade the downlink in order to uh, help others. So the best performance is achieved for a high value of, uh, for a, sorry, for a huge degradation of the downlink. However, we cannot, we don't want to uh, impact our performance in the downlink since we were gaining before. So we think that a good trade-off is to set n equal to four and having no degradation at all in the downlinks. So the downlinks are not going to be degraded, and the uplinks are going to be here, which is not our best score, but we can still profit from this game with respect to uh, full duplex system. This table summarizes what I just told you. In the downlink, for n equal to 4 and mu star equal to 1, I'm not going to degrade at all the downlink. And for the uplink, I'm going to enhance in a 25% with respect to a traditional full duplex system. However, we're still having a degradation with respect to half duplex. The degradation is not huge, but it's still important. And lastly, what if we have an ideal case in which the information is transmitted by a backbone or a wire network from a certain a central entity? The uplink is going to gain enormously. We can gain in a 78% with respect to full duplex and we can even surpass the performance of half duplex. So what we see is that we were able to propose an algorithm in which the uplink degradation is minimized, or reduced, sorry. Uh, we can maintain the performance of the downlink, and there is no need to switch between full duplex and half duplex, which can be quite uh, challenging. So, as conclusions, mainly what we see is that we cannot just plug and play full duplex in the network. There are huge challenges. The biggest challenge is the one concerning the degradation in the uplink. And this is why we uh, consider models in which we have low power regimes, so small cells, for instance, in order to cope with the high self interference and to the high code channel interference. However, we see that there are already some scenarios that are favorable for full duplex. We, when we have been forming, in the downlink we can be close to the theoretical uh, bound, which is doubling the capacity or doubling the average spectral efficiency. And for uplinks, if we're able to reduce the, the co-channel interference and the self interference, we saw that at the millimeter wave case, we're going to be as well close to this bound. But there are some, uh, there's an amount of open questions still. So, we never consider along our work the two-node full duplex model in which users are, are also uh, able to do full duplex. Uh, this brings some other challenges but some other gains at the same time. 
uh, it's super important to understand as well how much power consumption we're going to have in food duplex scenario. This is a key challenge for uh, 5G network, for instance, we want to reduce the consumption of energy. Uh, further, we have the dynamism in the traffic. There's some super interesting work by Professor Bacelli, for instance, which is proposing to entangle the geometry of the system and the dynamics of the traffic. So in this case, since we always consider full buffer in our models, which is arguably a worst case scenario, we can still gain for the dynamism of the traffic. And finally, uh, this is probably one of the uh, most important ones is that we are still not able to introduce full duplex in macrocells. Macrocells are, are still uh, quite uh, good for operators if we can cover higher areas. But since we are covering higher areas, we are going to transmit at higher, higher powers. So we cannot do that. And I'm just going to ask you two questions. Or I'm going to ask myself. I'm not expecting you to respond. Um, are we seeing full duplex? current networks. Are we going to see it in, in the short term? The answer is no. Uh, there is no mass deployment of this technology uh, and there is, at least me, I don't see uh, full duplex being used in the short term. However, it's a study super useful. The, the principle is, is challenging but it's super promising at the same time. What if we can uh, be close to doubling our performance? And at the same time, we see that there are some scenarios or some conditions that are quite similar to what we analyzed during our work. First, we have the dynamic TDB, which is going to be used in 5G, for instance. And uh, we have, at the same time, the, the coexistence of different systems. For instance, 4G and 5G in near bands of the spectrum. In this case, we will have this kind of interference at the same time. So our solutions could be implemented in these scenarios as well. Just to finish, uh, I'm just going to show you my, my list of publications, uh, patents, uh, our journal article, and the uh, conference articles. Thank you very much for your attention.